Good morning, class. Good morning, Brother Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and where I learn how to be an overcomer. And it is something you learn more about as you go. Uh, you know, the Bible said even Jesus himself, uh, when he was born a child, then as he grew up, he grew in wisdom. Well, that means he, he kept learning things. Well, he became a, a, a human being. He became like other men, the scripture said. And so uh, even though you're born again, that doesn't mean you're now fully developed in Christ. You're born a spiritual babe. And the scripture says, as newborn babes desire the sincere uh, milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. So say it out loud again, I'm growing. I'm, growing. I'm, developing. I'm developing. I'm increasing. I'm increasing. Hallelujah. Well, Father, all of us agree together today as touching this, asking for the, the things you know would help us to grow the, the quickest and yet develop the most completely and the most solidly in you. We ask for these things, and we thank you for your kindness and grace to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Look, please, in Hebrews, the third chapter, and also in 1 Corinthians 10, as we continue in our study that we're calling Overcoming Unbelief. As we've gone into some detail in previous uh, classes, unbelief may be the worst thing that could ever happen to you. I know that sounded like a giant statement, but we won't get into it. But uh, we saw that that's, that's the thing that could keep you out of heaven, could keep, rob you of eternal life and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's, it's mentioned repeatedly in the New Testament as something that we are to take heed about, we are to be on the watch for, on the guard about, and that we are to learn from the lessons of old. In, in the books of uh, Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and those things about what happened to them and where that first generation of Israelites went wrong and how they wound up missing the blessings of God for their life, missing the whole plan of God for their life. Now that's an awful thought, isn't it? To absolutely miss the whole plan of God for your life and to live a bleak, hard existence where you're not enjoying what you're supposed to enjoying. You know, uh, there are so many people in the earth today. They are so frustrated. They are uh, have become bitter and hard-hearted and just, you know, don't think life is worth living. And many of them ignorantly blame God. You know, why did God choose this for me? Well, who said he did? People say, well, if it's happening, it must be God. Said who? Where'd you get that? Not the Bible. And so the answers are here in the word. And if we as human beings will make some changes and come in line with him, you can live a completely different life. Amen. You can live a good life. Yes. Now, you'll still have to believe God. You'll still have to overcome some things, but you'll have the help. You'll have the grace. You'll have the strength. You'll have the instructions and direction and wisdom and all that you need. Thank God. The life of the victorious believer is a life worth living. It's a good life. We saw in Hebrews 3, uh, talking about these warnings, he said, I'm reading the New Living Translation of verse 7. He said, the Holy Spirit says today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts 
like Israel did when they rebelled and they tested me in the wilderness. Your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. He said, I was angry with them. Their hearts always turn away from me and they refuse to do what I, I tell them. So he said, they'll never enter my place of rest. Verse 15, remember what it says today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. In 1 Corinthians 10, we saw that he mentions that everything that happened to them happened as examples, as types, and they're written for our admonition. And uh, he mentions verse 1, 2, and 3, and 4, that they, all of them were under the cloud, all of them passed through the sea. They were all baptized to Moses in the cloud and the sea. They did eat the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual drink. And he is revealing the Spirit of God is that all of that is a type of Christ. He said they drank of that spiritual rock that accompanied them, that went with them, and that rock was Christ. Say it out loud, that rock that, rock. that they all drank of all was, Christ. was Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now go back to Exodus and let's, let's see what he's referring to the account he's referring to. This is number six in our study of the ten. And if you want to, to learn about the previous five, uh, go online, faithschool.org, and you can see all of them. No charge, won't cost you a thing. Take your time and, uh, and, and go one by one and get caught up with us. In Exodus, you know, uh, 14, 15, 16, we see the previous five incidents where they had an opportunity to show some faith in God, to show some trust, to show some confidence, but missed every opportunity. And you know, every day and every challenge is another opportunity to demonstrate that we believe in God, that we trust God. And it's not that you have to know all the answers in your head. You won't. But it's just that you have this abiding foundation of confidence in God that you stand on. That no matter what happens or what's not happening or what you know or you don't know or understand or you don't understand, you still don't lose it. You still have some peace. Why? God's with me. Right? You still have some positive outlook and even some joyous expectation. What? Well, He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He will never let me down. He always makes a way out, a way through, a way to overcome. He, he, nothing catches Him and by surprise or shocks Him. He already had the provision prepared before I knew I had a need. True or not? And if that's true, why do I need to get all bent out of shape? Why do I, right? Why do I need to go, you know, frazzled and, and scared and, and panicked? And I don't, I don't. And even though I may not have a clue in my head, what I'm going to do or how I'm going to get through this or out of this, it is a perfect opportunity for me to demonstrate, Lord, I trust you. Hmm? I'm looking to you. Right? And I am confident that because of your, your love for me, your faithfulness to me and to us, we're going to be okay. Right? So everybody said out loud, Lord. Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm looking to you. My, eyes My eyes are on you. Are on you. I, trust you. I trust you. Thank you, Thank you. In, advance in advance for getting me through it all. Through it all. Hallelujah. Now, that's what you do instead of this. Hmm? Could they have done something different from what they did? 
after all they'd seen, after all they experienced. They could. Verse 17, the, the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of Zin. And that's where all that happened with the manna. And uh, they pitched in Rephidim. So this is the next incident that we're studying of the ten. This is number six in our list. And there was what? Why, why did this become an incident? No water. Because, of course, now it's all over. Right? Huh? I mean, close the book, right? Now you're laughing. But would you have done any better? <laughs> you're out there. It is the desert. There's a lot of you. Your water reserves are gone. And nobody knows where the next oasis might be. And naturally speaking, you can't just go trekking across the desert without water indefinitely. You will die. And so when there was no water, the people did chide with Moses. And we were studying yesterday that that word means they strove with him. And strove is a form of the word strife. Strife. And we saw from James 3 that strife, where, where there's envying and strife, there's a manifestation of every kind of evil working and thing. It is literally the manifest presence of the devil, strife is. So the enemy is at work here. He's manifesting. Why? There, you, you, if you'd have been there, you could have felt it. Have you ever walked into a, a place where people had really been fighting? And even though you didn't hear what had been going on, you could feel it in the room. You see them glaring at each other. And you can, you can feel it. You can feel it spiritually and naturally. What, what do you feel? What do you mean you, you feel it? What are you feeling? It's a manifestation of evil, of the presence of evil, which is why you and I need to do whatever it takes to stop it and stay out of it and prevent it. You remember um, Abraham and his nephew Lot traveled with him and God blessed them with so much livestock that the land couldn't handle all of them. And it got to the point where they were fighting, the, the herders were fighting each other over the water spots. Again, water problems. And uh, at one point, Abram, who is the patriarch, he is the elder, Lot wouldn't have one cow if it wasn't for Uncle Abram. Hmm? I mean, he took him in when his brother had died and and treated him like a son and like family and apparently gave him some starter cows, right? And when he would buy or invest, he'd, Lot would get in on it with him. And, and when they would sell, they'd sell at the right time and the right place and they'd make money. And next thing you know, Lot's a wealthy man. And they got too many cows. But Abram goes to Lot and says, look. We can't have the strife. We cannot have it between, he said, we're brothers and we cannot have the strife. And so look, you tell me what you want to do. You want to go that way, I will get out of your way. But this strife is going to stop. And he allowed him to basically pick all the well-watered places and put him out in the dry. And he's the elder, he's the patriarch. But he did it. Why? Because he has faith. Oh, come on. Can you see this? And he knows strife will mess up my faith. Strife will interrupt and, and obstruct my provision from God and my protection from God. I can't allow this. We cannot have this. So he is willing to be taken advantage of. Financially speaking. And yet, again, faith. Why? He knows 
God's going to take care of me. Is that right? No matter what happens. And the next thing you know, as soon as that happens, the Lord says, okay, Abram, go out, look north, look south, look east. I'm giving all of it to you. So did it cost Abram anything? No. Now it costs a lot. We won't get into that, but we're just giving an example. Strife must be intolerable to the serious child of God. And if you say, well, you know, I grew up Irish, I grew up Italian, I grew up this, and you know, we get loud and we fight sometimes. Well, now you're a Christian. So it's time to change. I'm serious. I'm serious. You make excuses for it and you'll have strife the rest of your life. And it'll cost you. It'll cost you dearly. Because it's a yielding to the flesh. And it's a yielding to even wrong spirits. This, this anger, this rage, this yelling, this complaining, this blaming is what kept them out of the promised land. That's what he's warning us about in the New Testament. Say it out loud, no strife. No strife, no strife in my home. No strife in my heart. No strife. None. But that's what was going on with them. They strove. And you could, if, you'd have, if you'd have been there, you could have felt it. You've got to remember, hundreds of thousands of people in these camps out there. And this was just permeating the whole place. You could have felt it uh, at distance before you got there. And you could you'd have heard it too. The striving the blaming. And notice what, uh, and we're not given everything that was said. Uh, God didn't want us to hear, you know, 10 hours of strife. It's, it's uh, condensed into a phrase that gives you the picture of so much of what was being said. And this, this question and this thing, uh, or this statement rather, was a condensation of a lot of that strife. He, they said, chode with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Give us water, Moses. Another characteristic of unbelief is that it blames and pressures other people. It puts pressure on others. Give us water. Well, does he look like a well? What? Huh? Fire hydrant? I mean, what? Now you're laughing, but do people do this in modern times? You have to fix this. You've got to take care of me. You've got to do this. If you're looking to man, you're not looking to God. Huh? And if you're looking to God, you put no pressure on people. Say that loud. Faith in God, Faith in God. Puts, no puts no pressure on people. If you're putting pressure on people, what does that mean? You're looking to them to fix it. You're looking to them to provide for you, to give you the answer, to take care of you. You're not looking to God. You're looking to them. And you'll find over and over again, they have, they're not the answer. They don't have it. They can't do it. They can't produce it. Now all you're doing is destroying your relationship with them. Putting pressure on them that they can't handle. They can't fix. They can't give you what you're trying to make them give you. They, they can't. And that's frustrating for anybody. Look with me in Genesis at an example of this. Hallelujah. Genesis 30. Aren't we thankful for the Word of God? Genesis 30, which just a few pages back in the, in the scripture here, was the account of, of Rachel and Jacob. And when they got uh, married, um, she couldn't conceive. They, they wanted children and, and had not been able to conceive. Rachel, or excuse me, Leah, excuse me, Leah had been able to have children. But Rachel had not. 
And in chapter 30 and verse 1, when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. Now, didn't, didn't we read about envy being in connection with strife in, in James? Where envying and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. This is the manifest presence of the devil. Envying her sister, and she said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Now this is many years removed from the situation we're talking about at Rephidim, but it sounds just like it. Doesn't it? What? Give us water. We demand water. You ever heard anything like that in today's? Oh man, we live in the generation of entitlement. Huh? How many people go, we, we deserve, we have a right, we owe, you have to. Well, that means you're faithless, faithless individuals to talk like that and put pressure on other people and demand that other people meet your needs. When so many times they simply cannot. Well, what's Jacob's response? <laughs> she said, give me children or I'm going to die. How'd she get like this? Thinking on the wrong things. Hmm? Looking at the wrong things. Every day, instead of getting up, thanking God that she existed, that God knew about her, that she's alive, she's healthy, she's got a husband, he cares about her. Do you reckon there are things in her life she could have been thankful for? Huh? And her life's not over. Right? Who said she'd never be able to have a child? And you know, maybe other things are trying to tell her that, but God didn't tell her that. And so she, this, this has been brewing and building up inside her for some time. And every time she sees Leah and those babies... And those children, it chafes her. Instead of thanking God that they're okay, they're healthy, they're in good shape. This is selfish. Class, are you all away? This is uh, faith works by love. Well, unbelief works by something else. Can you see this? This is only thinking about yourself. What I don't have. What I don't have. I don't have. Still not pregnant. Still no babies. Still no children. My life means nothing. Lies. Lies. That's not all there is to life. And who said you'll never have a child? See, this, this hopelessness, this negative bent... It displeases God. It can even anger Him, especially when He's demonstrated His power and faithfulness to you over and over and over again, and still every time something comes up, you slide back into that junk. She said, you give me children or I'm going to die. And he says, am I God? <laughs> am I in God's stead? Pressure. Unbelief. Takes no responsibility for its own situation. Blames other people. Puts all the blame on them and then pressures them. You have to fix this. That's faithlessness talking. That's unbelief. Displeasing to God. Go back to Exodus. They said, give us water so we can drink. And Moses says, why are you chiding with me and wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Now we're going to see why he said that. The rest of the passage reveals some things that we're not yet aware of reading this. But he said, you are striving with me, you're fighting with me, and why are you testing the Lord? Testing the Lord. Keep reading. The people thirsted for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and they said, 
Wherefore is this that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Now, the enemy, he always tries to influence that there was a sinister plan against you from the start. Because, see, he's not content just to get you to talk unbelief for a day. He wants to sever you from your supply of word, of faith, of God. Because then he can really destroy you. But as long as you're connected to that source of faith, he, you know, he's going to have to keep working on you and you're liable to win this thing anyway. But if he can sever you so that you decide that your God connection is your problem. Can you see? Now, now, he, now he's going to get you to where he can actually destroy you. And so they're saying, Did this, isn't this what we had said? You brought us out of Egypt to kill us. This was the sinister plan all along. God and Moses had framed up on us. Boy, that's going to a lot of trouble. Is that right? <laughs> Just to starve somebody of water. I mean, that's, there's got to be easier ways to do this <laughs> than 10 signs and wonders and splitting the Red Sea. And why rain manna out of heaven when you want people to starve anyway? I mean, that's, yeah. But all of this stuff from the enemy is unreasonable. It is illogical. And if he can get you mad enough and bitter enough and upset enough, you won't even stop to realize how stupid what you're saying is. You're just mad. You're just upset. And they're just, they're out to get me. Who's out to get you? Moses. Really? Yes, and Aaron. They're out to kill us. They're out to kill us. No, you've been listening to the wrong stuff. Moses cried to the Lord and he said, what will I do with this people? They'd be almost ready to stone me. He said, they're ready to kill me, Lord. Somebody say strife, 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 strife. This sixth incident emphasizes strife. And unbelief is a partner with strife. And let's make up our mind, I'm not going to yield to it. Is that right? Say it out loud, I refuse. I refuse. To yield to strife. To yield to strife. I will, live I will live in the peace of God. In the peace of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our time's up for today, but as you can see, we're just getting into this. Come back tomorrow and let's learn some. We want to make sure Moses didn't get stoned, you know. Come back tomorrow. We'll see you in faith school. I've got the victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today. But you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.